dance floor as you can hear what he has to say. He's with his dance floor, he thinks the world is all over. What up, Nets fans? Nets boy here, bring your latest in your Brooklyn Nets news. All right, it's been a little over a week and a half since my last Nets boy episode, um, in which the Nets did play six more games, and they went five and one during that stretch of games, which is fantastic. I was hoping for at least four and two, and they went five and one. So Nets boy is very happy with what he's seen from the Nets, at least records wise. Um. That being said, there's still a lot of concern I have for this Nets team, which we'll touch upon uh, shortly. Um, I do want to start off, though, talking about the one loss they did have, which was that terrible national televised game against the, the Warriors. I mean, that game was another predictable game. I mean, first of all, the Warriors this year, I mean, they look like the Warriors of old before Durant played for the Warriors years ago. Like, you remember the original Warriors that ended up winning 73 games. This team has that type of feel to it. They're just playing fantastic. And, and fantastically. they playing fantastically. English. Anyway, um, and they just... Steph Curry's playing at an MVP level. Remember, he is the MVP, in my opinion, to start, even though we're only 17 games in. Um, and just that team just is just so well coached. And that was like the biggest takeaway I took from that loss to the Nets. It's just, just how much more of a coach Steve Kerr is than Steve Nash. And, and look, we all know that I blame Steve Nash for a lot. If you remember last year, I blamed him for the reason why the Nets lost to the Bucks. Just other than the injuries, I, you know, remember he was my number one donkey. Remember I did the top three donkeys of, 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 of the playoffs for the Nets, and he was number one. I'm always going to be critical of Steve Nash because to this day, I still don't think the guy should have gotten the job, okay? I, I, I've, been, I've been very clear about it in the past. I, I understand why he got the job. I just don't think he should have or that he's really, at this point, a good coach. And I think that was very evident in that loss to the Warriors, okay? Let's just look, th- look at what happens here. So, Steve Nash says... Going into this game, we're 11 and 4. We're playing great. Guys are figuring out their roles, right? Like they're still kind of figuring it out. We have a really good thing going on right now with having LaMarcus Aldridge kind of being the de facto sixth man, right? Especially Joe Harris is out, right? Joe Harris has the ankle injury. He's not going to be able to play. Let's take Patty Mills to start, plug him into the starting lineup. Sure. Why not? I can get behind that. Similar type of games, both really fantastic three shooters. Matter of fact, I think they're one and two or or two and three in the NBA in three-point percentage right now. So, okay, I can get behind that. Take Patty Mills, plug him in as the starting in the starting lineup without Joe Harris. But we have this great flow going with Lamarcus Aldridge, right? Like he's been the arguably the third or fourth best player on this Nets team behind Durant and Harden. So why? Why does Steve Nash say, yeah, forget LaMarcus Aldridge. Let's not play this guy at all. Why does he say, let's not have him in the rotation until, oh, wait, we're down 15 points in the third quarter when we're desperate for offense. What the hell is that? You know what that is? It's overcoaching. That's what coaches who aren't good coaches do. They overcoach. This is what Steve Nash's philosophy was. Oh, no. The Warriors shoot a lot of threes. They do a lot of high screens to try to get their shooters like Steph Curry and all the other guys open and shoot threes and try to get the mismatch. LaMarcus Aldridge is not a switch defender. He's not a versatile enough defensive player. He's a little slow, so he has to always play drop coverage defense. It means he has to sag off on the pick and rolls. Well, you don't want a defensive player like that against a shooter like Steph Curry or all the other Warriors because when you sag off, they'll shoot the three over him. So that's why Steve Nash said, whoa, 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 we got to, we can't, we can't play the Marcus Aldridge. We need to play, you know, James Johnson as the f- small, de facto small ball five 
so we can switch one through five because, you know, that's what we want to do. Let's completely abandon everything else that has worked for us to make us 11 and four. The fact that we've seen that, let's be honest now, the Nets needed LaMarcus Aldridge. Of those 11 wins, I guarantee you most of those games were because LaMarcus Aldridge scored at least 15 points. So we need LaMarcus, we need someone to score in the second unit, right? But, let, but no, no, let's ignore this previous success the Nets have and let's be too cute and overcoach and not play Aldridge. And what did we see? We saw the Nets hang around in the first half. But once the second unit came in, a second unit that doesn't have Patty Mills anymore because he's in the starting lineup, and now you take out the next best score off the bench in Aldridge, well, what do you got? You've got DeAndre Bembry, who, by the way, has been very good this year, but he's not a scorer. He's a defensive energy guy, right? So Bembry... He's not giving you any offense, okay? Uh, uh, with James Johnson, no. Oh, also, by the way, James Johnson can't grab a damn rebound. Just, you know, I hate that. Okay, who 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 else we got in that in that in that second unit? Oh, Javon Carter, yeah, Javon Carter. He's gonna take over and be the offensive guy. Come on, there was just it doesn't make sense to me. I'm sorry. I get it. I get why Steve Nash did it. He wants the switching, but that's not why it's why move away from what's been working so well. You needed LaMarcus Aldridge to play. And the other thing that kind of drove me crazy is if you're going to take out a score in Patty Mills and put him in the starting lineup, you need to replace Patty Mills with the score. Yet once again, Steve Nash waited way too long to put Cam Thomas in. He put Cam Thomas, I believe, in the third quarter. And Cam Thomas isn't getting in the flow of the offense. He's just kind of been there, but he's a scorer. And that's something else that's kind of frustrating me. We also saw Cam Thomas in the game against the um, the Magic when Kevin Durant was out with the shoulder sprain. We saw that later on, Cam Thomas got some rotational minutes. But they're not giving him a chance to score. Like, you got to give this guy an opportunity to score. He's a scorer. But if you don't get the ball in his hands, he's not going to score. So, therefore, you're not utilizing his skill set to the fullest potential. So, you might as well not play him. You might as well, if you're going to have, you know, a guy play eight minutes a game and just be a spot-up shooter like they're making Cam Thomas right now, you should play Kelster, Kelsler Edwards, who's a 3 and D guy, who would be better a fit for that, right? Like, Common sense. So it drove me nuts that Steve Nash abandoned any type of offensive strategy for defense, which is a little bit of a shock, but it clearly didn't work. And then, and of course, the second unit was garbage. And then Durant struggled in the game. James Harden was a piece of crap. The whole team just couldn't get into an offensive flow. And the third quarter, the biggest thing that happened, because the next I think we're only down by seven going into the third quarter. What happened at halftime? Steve Kerr said, I'm a real coach. And what do real coaches do? They make adjustments. He saw exactly what Steve Nash was doing with not playing LaMarcus Aldridge and doing the constant switching. And he said, you know what we're going to do, guys? We're going to slip screen now. We're going to have our bigs cut to the basket. If they want to play up on us like they've been doing, let them do that because I got Stephen Curry, and I, he's going to make the right play. And that's what he did. And then he said, oh, you know what? If you're going to do that, let me get the ball in, into Andrew Wiggins' hands who can slash to the basket and is a bigger body and can get physical. When Go ahead, set the screen on him. We'll have him set the screen. What are you going to do? Steph Curry's going to get the ball to Andrew Wiggins and go into the basket. So Steve Kerr made the adjustments because he's a real coach. Steve Nash does stupid things like not play LaMarcus Aldridge to the third, and that's why the Nets suck and lost on national TV and look like a joke of a team. Because once again, Steve Nash is a donkey. I should have my donkey sound going right now, but I didn't think that far ahead. Hee-haw, hee-haw. Anyway, donkey. He's, he's just, it's very frustrating. Very frustrating to watch. But at the end of the day, the Nets are still 12 and five. And you gotta be pleased about that. So that loss was terrible. But like I said, they bounced back with a good win, with a couple good wins after that. Um, a, Gutsy win against the Magic without Kevin Durant with the shoulder sprain. The Nets are banged up right now. I mean, no Joe Harris with the ankle injury. No Kevin Durant with the shoulder sprain, though they do expect him to be back sooner rather than later. 
Nicholas Claxton still has this mysterious illness that he's there on the sidelines, but he's not participating. At first, I thought it was a ramping up thing, but I don't know what the hell is going on with Claxton. And then you got Paul Millsap out for personal reasons, and he's been missing the last couple games. So the Nets just really have not had a, a full complementary of players, and we all know Kyrie is being Kyrie. So, you know, it's interesting. And I think with all of that, the fact that they're 12-5 and five is fantastic. But now, there is still concern for this team, as I mentioned earlier. And that is the fact that this team can't seem to beat anyone who is good. Which is funny, because this was the opposite of last year. Last year, the Nets were historically beating good teams, but losing to weaker teams. Like, they would take the weaker teams for granted, and they would get beaten by them. They would lose to teams like the Magic, like the Pistons, like those teams, right? This year is completely different. They're taking care of business against teams under 500, but I believe they're like two and two and four. Yeah, they're two and four against teams over 500. So all of a sudden they're different now. They're beating up the teams that they should beat up on, but they're losing to the teams that they're either at their level or better. And that is level of, for concern because as we all know, come playoff time, you're not playing any sub-500 teams. I mean, you might be, if you're the one seed, you might be playing like an eight seed or a nine or ten seed with the play-in. You know, there's a chance in the first round if you're a top two seed, you can play a team that's under 500. But reality is, you're going to play teams over 500 and the better teams. So there is level of concern there. And the other thing is, it's not just that they're losing to these teams that are above 500. They're getting blown out, right? Blown out by the Hornets. Though I don't really believe the Hornets are a 500 team. I mean, are going to stay at that pace? I mean, I think they're right around 500 now. But at the time, they were above 500. Blow out against the Hornets. Blow out against the Wizards, right? Not, excuse me, not the Wizards. The Warriors, right? Um, what was the other? Blow out against the Bucks, right? Like, like th these are the teams that it's going to, like, so it is kind of disturbing to see that they're getting blown out by these better teams. And that's just something the Nets are going to need to figure it out, you know, figure out. Um, but look, right now, in the regular season, it's not always about beating the best teams. It's about getting some wins and being on a, a top two team in the, in the East. And that's what they are right now. They're tied with the Heat and the Wizards. I think just the Wizards now. I'm sorry. I lost track. Who? Yeah, just the Wizards. Yeah, the Heat are 11-6 and six now. The Wizards and the Bulls. Three-way tie. Uh, no. Nets are by themselves in first place. They're 12 and 5. The other teams are 11 and 5. Woohoo! I just noticed that. I actually really check these things ahead of time, right? But once again, I do very little preparation, if at all, for any of these episodes. It's literally like put on the Nets boy uniform, press record, and just start talking. Um, but anyway, um, so yeah, that's our in first place. So I guess at the end of the day, you know, you take the 12 and 5 record. You take the fact that they haven't been beating the good, the good, the better teams, but they're doing what they're supposed to do. They're beating the worst teams. They're beating the teams they're supposed to beat, and you can't be that upset about that because at the end of the day, if you beat teams that you are truthfully better than, you will be a 50-win team in the NBA as long as you are a team like this. Like this Nets team, if they do that, they will have over 50 wins, if not more, just beating teams that they are definitely better than. So, hey, it's not a perfect situation. But we're getting there. And who knows? Maybe once everyone starts coming back healthy and, uh, you know, everyone's able to figure out their roles again and Steve Nash stops being a donkey and plays, you know, Aldridge the right amount of minutes in the rotation and maybe figures out the way to get, get Cam Thomas more involved. I mean, the guy's getting an opportunity to play now. Granted, it's only about six to eight minutes a game, but he's getting a chance to be out there. You got to use the guy. Let him get the ball and shoot. But anyway, so, look, it is what it is. We'll see what happens moving forward. Now, let's look at the next couple games for the Nets as I go to my phone once again because I have zero preparation. Okay, next couple games for the Nets. The next game is Monday the 22nd against the Cavs, a game in which they had just recently, I mean, a team that they just recently played, and they won 109-99, to but that was a Cavs team that didn't have Jared Allen. Colin Sexton, I believe, is out for the year. So uh, uh, Evan uh, Mobley didn't play in that game either. I don't know the status of Mobley. 
and Jared Allen in the game coming up. We know Sexton's out for the year, so that was so. But once again, Nets are better than the Cavs. They are better than them, so they should win that game. Then they have the Celtics, which we all know the Celtics are just a team of confusion, and no one knows what's going on with them. Um, that's a game the Nets could lose because the Celtics are either going to be great or terrible because that's who the Celtics are. But once again, they should win that game. And then Saturday, the 27th, that is going to be a fun game against the first place team or the second place team because the Warriors are the first place team. Second place team in the West, Phoenix Suns. That is going to be a good game. And that will be a very good test for this Nets team about beating teams that are better than you or at your level. And that's what the Suns are. So that's a great game. And then after that, they've got the ever so fun epic game against the Knicks. Um, and, and that point is now I'm just going to pivot to one final thought before this video goes on too long. Because once again, they go way too long. The Knicks game just popped a memory into my head about uh, another thing about the Warriors game. And um, that is these Brooklyn, Net, these Brooklyn Nets fans. These Brooklyn fans, basically. Um, you know, the Knicks, like I said, the Knicks made me realize it because every time the Nets play the Knicks... In Barclays Center, it's not a Brooklyn Nets game. It's a New York Knicks game because there's not a lot of Nets fans in the arena. They're like probably 70 to 80 percent Knicks fans, and but that's okay. I'm always acceptance of accepting of that, right? Like I'm accepting of the fact that Brooklyn is the second team in New York. That majority of New Yorkers, as well as a lot of people in New Jersey, like where I'm from, I'm, I live in New Jersey. A lot of people here are Knicks fans, you know, especially a lot of them when the Nets moved to Brooklyn. I know a lot of former New Jersey Nets fans that said, hey, if it ain't going to be in Jersey, I guess I'll go with the Knicks because either their parents were Knicks fans and they were following the Nets because they were only Jersey. So they're like, all right, let me go that route. You know, not every Nets fan, not every New Jersey Nets fan was like me and converted to Brooklyn Nets because, you know, I just followed the franchise. Um, a lot of them just said, forget it, I'll join the Knicks. So I understand why that is, why the Knicks always, Nick fans always show up at the Barclays Center and, and just overshadow the Nets fans. I understand that. But what happened in that Warriors game is one of the most disgraceful things I think I've ever seen in my lifelong fandom. To hear your alleged home fans chant MVP for a visiting player is a disgrace to the organization. It's a disgrace to the fans that call themselves Nets fans. The Brooklyn, Brooklyn people. How the hell can you allow that? How the hell could you have any pride in your team knowing that not the Knicks, who we once again know they're all there. The Golden State Warriors, a team that is literally across the country. Out show you? and show you up and that arena was like 70 percent warrior fans maybe not quite that much how i i get it everyone loves steph curry i get it the warriors for years had a dynasty and built a huge fan base and those fans are still around i get it but how how can i thought brooklyn people had pride in their location and who they are i thought brooklyn net fans were supposed to have pride that was the whole point of them moving to brooklyn was that they weren't selling enough tickets in new jersey there wasn't enough excitement because it's new jersey the armpit of new york blah 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 no one cares about them let's go to brooklyn new york new york brooklyn stand up and then you let the Golden State Warrior fans from across the country show you up in your own arena and chant FAP for a visiting player when you've got Kevin Durant on your team. Are you kidding me? 
That is a disgrace. And I'm embarrassed. <laughs> Nuts Boy, where were you? I live like two hours away from the Barclay Center. I'm not going to a Warriors game, Warriors Nets game. I do try to go to Nets games, but it's not an easy commute for me all the time. But how? I where's the Brooklynites? Where are these people who supposedly have pride? Where's Brooklyn at? Right? We see it on TV. Where's Brooklyn at? We see all these pictures that these alleged net fans are sending in, showing pictures of, of them and their pets and babies, all in Nets attire. And then we have the Brooklyn chair. Brooklyn, Brooklyn. Well, where the hell are you guys? Where the hell are you? Where? You weren't there Tuesday. Sometimes this organization is still a joke. As great as they are, and the fact they have championship aspirations, at the end of the day, sometimes this organization is just a flat joke. And I really didn't think I was going to get this much into this, but like it just kind of stirred up when I, once again, like I said, looking at the schedule, saw the Knicks, and it just reminded me of the disaster that was. But hey, they're 12-5 and five in first place in the East, so I guess it's okay. And hey, you know what? The one thing I can do is I can rest easy knowing that I'm still a passionate Nets fan. Always have been, always will be. There's not a lot of us out there. Apparently I have 161 subscribers, so I like to assume that's 161 passionate Nets fans, even though these episodes tend to only have about 20 to 25 views right now. Not putting those two and two things together right now. I'm still trying to figure that one out. So... <laughs> But anyway, the point is, I'm sure there's more of us out there. I know there's more of us out there. But it's just a real big disappointment to see and hear that in that Golden State Warriors game. It was just another stick it to you, despite the fact that I got blown out. But that's enough of that. This video went on too long. Hope you're still with me. So anyway, that's the game's coming up. Who knows when the next Nets Boy episode is going to be, as we all know. Blah, 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 Nets boy's busy. It's very hard for me to do these episodes. I say that at every episode. So when I have a chance to do another one, I will. Hopefully it won't be longer than another week or so. Just keep your eyes open, and let's see what happens with the Nets moving forward. So until then, this is Nets boy telling the Nets fans to stand up. Brooklyn, stand up. And signing off.